thank you all very much for being here. Uh, we make it a habit to start promptly five minutes late. That is the uh, custom and practice. That way everybody gets a chance to get in from the parking lot, grab a cookie, uh, get themselves settled. But uh, we want to get started relatively timely uh, just to make good use of everybody's time and to respect your time as well. I'm Santa Clara County Supervisor Joe Simidian. I represent the 5th Supervisorial District, which includes uh, the Cupertino and the Cupertino area actually about 400,000 folks in the West Valley and the North County uh, portions of Santa Clara County. I'm also privileged to serve as chair of the Board of Supervisors this year. So I wanna welcome you to the event. It looks like there's plenty of seating. I'm pleased to hear that. And um, I do wanna ask just a couple of quick questions about how you heard about tonight's meeting before we get started. And I'll share a little bit of information about what we're gonna do and who all these people are sitting up here in a row are ready to respond to questions. But um, how many of you heard about tonight's meeting because you got something in the mail? Show of hands. Okay, apparently that worked. How many of you heard about tonight's meeting because you got a phone call with my voice on it? Fewer, okay. How many of you uh, got uh, some kind of social media announcement that this was happening tonight? How many of you were on my email list? Okay, good to know, thank you. We're just trying to find out what works and what doesn't uh, in terms of how we uh, reach out to you. And uh, what I wanted to say is thank you for attending this, which is our fourth annual town hall uh, about the Lehigh Cement and uh, Quarry. Some of you will know I began holding these meetings uh, when I came back on the board a few years ago uh, because my sense was that there were folks in the community that had questions uh, about the operations of the plant, that it was uh, tougher than it should be or need be uh, to get answers to those questions. And so I uh, wanted to create a venue in which people could ask their questions and get good answers and particularly have access to the folks I'm about to introduce in a few minutes. My hope is that we will get uh, answers for you for the questions that we have tonight. We have a uh, panel of state and local regulators here to do that. And after some brief remarks on my part, we'll get to that. Uh, I think it's helpful for folks to have a little bit of history on this. I know some of you have a long history, but a little bit of history from my perspective. Uh, when I came back on the Board of Supervisors in the year 2013, after having been in the state legislature for a dozen years, uh, there were a couple of things that had already happened. Uh, and one of those was that in 2011, prior to my return, the Board of Supervisors had made a determination on something called vested rights. And vested rights was a decision that was made about where mining activities could or could not occur without a use permit and where a use permit would be required uh, at the Lehigh property. And about, I would say something like 2,200 of the 3,500 acre property is vested for mining activities and uh, proposals to mine outside that vested area require a use permit from the county. So there's sort of two different pieces of the same large property, areas that have been deemed to be vested back in 2011 uh, and where certain rights apply, and then areas where that is not the case. Also before I came back, and if it seems like I'm underscoring this happened before I came back, it's because I am. Uh, in 2012, the Board of Supervisors approved an amendment to what's called the Quarries Reclamation Plan, which encompasses about hmm, maybe 1,200 of the 3,500 acres. And the reclamation plan uh, outlines what the plan and the timing for how the site will be restored uh, after the conclusion of the mining, whenever that time comes. So again, both of these things took place back in 2011, 2012. There was the vested rights determination at the County Board of Supervisors. There was the reclamation plan amendment also at the Board of Supervisors. Both of those uh, rulings were the subject of court challenges, which I'll have our county counsel's office tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes. Uh, but I should indicate that they were both subject to judicial review and in both cases were upheld in the courts. So the vested rights and reclamation plan that are in place were as approved by the board prior to my return to the board and uh, also subject to judicial review. Now, once I came back on the board in 2013 and took a look at these issues, and I should tell you, as I've said in prior uh, get-togethers like this, I told uh, the staff from my office, look, Lehigh's gonna be with us on the first day we're in office. Lehigh's gonna be with us on the last day we walk out. You can't have an operation of this magnitude cheek by jowl with residential development 
without there being some inherent tensions. So as I said, I knew this was going to be on our to-do list the very first day I walked into the office. I fully expect it will be on our keep doing it right up until the last day in office. And um, that has certainly been the case at least over the past six years since I came back uh, to the board. But when I did come back and uh, asked my staff to help me take a look at what was and wasn't happening, there were two or three things uh, that I thought we might do relatively quickly. And I think it was in early 2014, after I'd been back a little more than a year, I uh, um, issued a memo and asked the uh, county executive and the director of planning and development if we could do three things. This is back in 2014 now. The first was, could we increase our presence on the Lehigh property from a couple of times a year, which seemed inadequate to me, to monthly? So could we just have boots in the ground, have somebody there on the site, walking the site, looking around, seeing what was actually happening at the Lehigh cement plant and quarry on a more or less monthly basis? And I thought that made sense for two reasons. Reason number one, I thought we needed to be there at least on a monthly basis if we were going to do our job. Reason number two, when I got calls from community members who said, are you aware of this, or are you aware of that, or we're concerned about this, that, or the other, I wanted to be able to say either, I am, because we've had somebody out there from the planning department, or, gee, that's not what we're hearing, are you sure? We've had planning staff out there at the last month, two or three, and they've got a different understanding. So I thought it was important both to know, but also to be able to respond in real time when we heard from members of the community. Second thing I did was ask the county, and the county planning department in particular, to host twice yearly coordination meetings with all of the various regulatory agencies that play a role on the site. And one of the challenges that we have, I think, in terms of regulatory activity on the site, and one of the challenges that I hear from the folks I represent about is the challenge of keeping track of who's responsible for what. You will see that we have a dozen people up here tonight just to respond to questions. They are from at least a half a dozen different agencies. There are probably four or five other agencies who we couldn't get here tonight. It is hard to make sure that you are getting the job done if you have 12 different folks who have to coordinate. And it's tough, frankly, to give good answers if you have 12 different sets of folks you have to go to to get answers to your questions. So as I say, the second thing I asked was, could we at least get everybody in the same room twice a year to sit down and talk to one another and make sure that people were sharing information and that people weren't just sort of pointing past each other in terms of whose responsibility it was to get what work done. The third thing I asked was that we have a report out, meaning a meeting like this one that would allow the community to receive an update from these various regulatory agencies and also to ask questions. So this is the fourth annual public meeting where we've assembled like this so that the public can get an update on regulatory activities and ask your questions and that it's an opportunity as well for the agencies that regulate the quarry and the cement plant to share with you what they're doing. So thank you for being here. If I didn't say that earlier, I want to say it again. I know there are other places you might like to be tonight, but thank you for being here. A couple of other steps we've taken along the way that I want to share with you. After we got those three steps underway, I said, you know, one of the things we need to do is look at the conditions of approval that apply to the Lehigh cement plant and quarry. So I had my staff in cooperation with the planning department and our county council's office at the county review what are known as conditions of approval for the plant's operation. When we did that back in 2014, we discovered that there was a $75,000 performance bond that was supposed to be in place that had never apparently been in place, or if it had, it was years and years ago. That's probably the more likely circumstance. But regardless, the bond wasn't in place, and because the bond wasn't in place, we worked with our county council's office and reached out to Lehigh and said, hey, let's get the performance bond in place so that the conditions of approval are in fact satisfied. Also, it'll seem a small thing, but I thought it was important. Back in 2015, we asked the planning staff if they could upgrade the website so that more information was more easily available, e just simply easy to find. Um, I'll let you be the judge of whether or not that's the case these days. User-friendly means different things to different people. But again, part of the accountability, it seemed to me, was making sure that there was the ability to get answers to the questions that you had and that that information should be online. And then also about that same time, late 2015, we started to have a series of monthly calls between my office 
and Lehigh. And we had been in touch fairly frequently anyway, but it just seemed to me that one way to make sure that things didn't slip through the cracks was to have a monthly call scheduled on which either I or a member of my staff, and most of the time it's a member of my staff, Christina Loquist, who is over here, who's gonna raise her hand, um, to, uh, handles the call where we talk to management at Lehigh and tell them what we're hearing from the community. They tell us what they think it's important for us to know, what they want us to know, what their perception is on the issues we're bringing to them. But it just seemed to me having a direct line of communication that was established and uh, regular would help us all make sure that uh, people were getting the message sooner rather than later. Then, um, many of you in the room will know in 2015 and 2016, the county's environmental health staff uh, stepped up their monitoring and oversight on the property as a result of numerous noise complaints that we were getting. Uh, last year, there were some significant changes at the plant. We'll hear about that in a minute, I think, uh, but they have uh, certainly been some improvement, whether enough, we'll hear from you, uh, and we can also hear whether that means uh, we're now seeing full compliance or not but the noise issues were um, certainly top of mind when we had our previous hearings in this room and uh, relief took a little while to come, but um, some progress has been made. And then, uh, no surprise to almost all of you, I'm sure, a uh, few, few weeks back, uh, we scheduled a hearing at the Board of Supervisors committee level, and I should tell you that in addition to having a planning commission, which is a body that most of you are probably familiar with, and I see we have a couple of county planning commissioners who are here. Could you raise your hands just so people know that you're here? Don't be shy. They're nice people, I promise. Okay, good. Um, thank you. Appreciate the both of you being here. Um, we also have five standing committees. One of them is called the Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. So I ask that the current issues around truck traffic and notices of violation um, be agendized so that the staff could report in a public setting what was happening, and they did that at our most recent meeting of the Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. I know that's a lot of jargon, but the short version is I wanted to create a public forum where we could get public feedback and reports from our own county staff uh, about what was happening. I think most of you in the room will know that a uh, relatively recent business arrangement between the Lehigh folks and the Stevens Creek Quarry folks resulted in um, some community impacts, I'll just put it that way, and uh, got some letters and some emails flying between and among the various parties, and um, I think it might be helpful, just so you know, some of you may have gotten these out front, if not, they're available on my website, but got a letter from the city of Cupertino and then got a letter from the legal counsel for the Lehigh Quarry and then the legal counsel for Stevens Creek Quarry. And when you get letters with words like unacceptable, illegal, flout, what else have we got here? Blithely, cursory, insufficient, bald omission, and responses like distasteful, deliberately provokes, no ulterior motives, subversive, and what else did we get? Incorrect, absurd, incorrect, unfair, and aggressive. At that point, I discerned that there was perhaps some controversy that needed to be addressed. Well, let's just put it that way. Uh, and uh, we have convened folks at the county, uh, and that has resulted uh, in some activity that, again, I'm going to ask them to share uh, in terms of the recent concerns that people have expressed. I've also had an opportunity to talk directly with folks at Lehigh, I guess, gee, just a few days before Christmas, a relatively brief conversation, uh, spoken to our county council's office, our planning department about this issue, as well as um, uh, folks at the city staff here in Cupertino. And uh, as I mentioned, we had the update in a public setting just a week or so ago about uh, what was happening at the county level. Uh, before we get started with questions, and I want to get to that right away, um, I do want to recognize some of the elected officials who are here. Uh, I know that Tom Pike is here representing Congressman Ro Khanna, and we appreciate that. Uh, I saw uh, Council Member 
John Willie, who was right here in front of me, thank you very much, as well as uh, Mayor Stephen Scharf, I thought I saw. Thank you. Good to see you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to uh, do this on the quick and say welcome to Rod Sinks, council member who's walking uh, in the back. And um, do we have any other elected officials who I haven't up right here in front of me? Please stand and introduce yourselves, everybody. I'm just going to do it this way quickly if I haven't caught you. And I do want to point out that Los Altos and Los Altos Hills are places that I do hear from uh, as well on this set of issues. Any other elected officials that I have failed to introduce? Yes. Thank you. From the Santa Clara Valley Water District. Thank you, Nye. Um, and anybody else? And I apologize, Nye, because we said hi earlier when I walked in and then I still managed to overlook you. All right. Then what I want to do is thank uh, a couple of folks before we turn to the panel, uh, most particularly the city of Cupertino, which is once again providing the venue plus the refreshments. So if you wonder where the refreshments came from, say thank you to someone from the city of Cupertino. Uh, they've also arranged for the taping of the meeting tonight. Uh, and uh, that's important because it, the meeting is being not only streamed, but will be uh, archived for uh, review later if you wish to do so. Uh, as to how the meeting is going to go in tonight, I hope you signed in when you arrived. You don't have to, certainly. But if you do, that will ensure that uh, you're added to a list of interested parties and we will keep you up to date on things here, as well as send you an occasional update. We try to not overdo it, so let us know if we do. There are a number of handouts out in the front room there. Um, they include the recent letters that I alluded to, the back and forth. Uh, they also include what are known as notice of violations that were issued to both Lehigh and Stevens Creek Quarry. And those handouts are also available on my website. Um, we've tried to put some of the basics right there on our website. If you just go to the uh, homepage at the Supervisor Submitian website, it'll say Lehigh. Click there, and it'll be a relatively easy to access list of various documents you may uh, find. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. We're going to start right here and go right down the road. And then uh, I'll ask them some questions so we can get a baseline of information. And uh, after what I hope is about mm, no more than 30 minutes, uh, we'll move into the portion of the evening where the panel will address questions that you provide. And if you have a question, please write it down on a card. And please write clearly. Uh, and my staff will collect it from you. You just hold your card up, and somebody will come get it. And if you need more cards, hold your hand up, and we'll get you some more cards. And. Um, we do that to kind of keep things moving along and consolidate questions where there are similar questions. Uh, I know there are going to be a lot of questions, there always are, but we're going to shoot to wrap up by 9 p.m. And um, why don't we go ahead and get started. And please do tell us not only your name, but your title, your organization, and roughly what you're in charge of. Briefly and roughly, please. Okay. Thank you. My name is Nicholas Maiden. I am a manager within the engineering division of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, the agency that is responsible for managing the air quality within the nine counties of the Bay Area. In particular, we have jurisdiction over regulating air pollution from stationary sources. I oversee the section that evaluates permit applications from some of the more complex facilities, including petroleum refineries, bulk terminals, and material processing and handling facilities, one of which is the Lehigh facility. And I'm John Marvin. I also work for the- Hang on area. just a second. Is he live? Can you hear him? Let's, let's. I'm John Marvin. Uh, okay. I also work with the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. I'm a manager in the Compliance and Enforcement Division. Uh, I have uh, managerial, managerial responsibility for the Lehigh facility as well as uh, all the South Bay, basically. Good evening. I'm Bill Johnson. I'm the Chief of Wastewater and Enforcement with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. The Water Board is charged with preserving, enhancing, and restoring water quality within the San Francisco Bay region, including all of its various watersheds and uh, groundwater aquifers as well. My role in particular is managing surface water discharges and overseeing many of the Water Board's enforcement activities and also coordinating with all of the other Water Board programs. Good evening, my name is Kirsten Struve. I work for the Santa Clara Valley Water District. I'm a senior water resources specialist. The water district um, provides flood protection, clean, safe water, and stream stewardship in Santa Clara County. And I, in particular, work on water quality issues, um, including water quality of reservoirs. 
Good evening. Rob Eastwood. I'm the manager of the Plain Office of County Santa Clara. Uh, we manage land use in the county and the unincorporated areas. As you might imagine, Lehigh is in the unincorporated area. Uh, and we would manage uh, things such as use permits or other land use. We also oversee SMARA, which you'll hear tonight, which is the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act. And that ensures that every mining activity uh, will reclaim to a natural or open space state uh, at the end of mining. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Elizabeth Pianca. I'm the lead deputy county counsel for the county of Santa Clara. Um, I advise the county and the Department of Planning and Development on land use and planning matters, including Lehigh. Good evening, my name is Michael Rossi. I am also a lead deputy county counsel. I and a team of attorneys that I supervise, advise and assist county departments with enforcement matters. Good evening. My name is uh, Roger Lee. I'm the Acting Director of Public Works for the City of Cupertino. So welcome, City of Cupertino residents. Uh, I'm responsible for everything that's in the city's right-of-way. So include your streets, the, uh, the intersections, and, and the like. Um, that would be it. And who's next? Good evening, my name is Rochelle Gaddy. I work with the County Department of Environmental Health. I am the Director of the Consumer Protection Division. We are responsible for enforcing the noise sections of the County Ordinance Code in the unincorporated areas. Good evening, I'm Jennifer Ka'aha'aina. I am a Hazardous Materials Program Manager, also with Santa Clara County Department of Environmental Health. Uh, we're responsible for implementing several state and local hazardous materials programs, collectively referred to as the Unified Program. We're authorized by Cal EPA to implement this throughout most of Santa Clara County and covering approximately 6,000 facilities, including the Lehigh facility. Uh, so the Unified Program focuses on the prevention of hazardous materials releases, accidents, injuries, and also minimizing the impacts of releases when they occur through emergency uh, preparedness efforts. Good evening. Uh, Craig Waitman, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm the Habitat Conservation Program Manager. I'm on the regulatory side, so we oversee our Lake and Stream Alteration Program, California Endangered Species Act, and also have a role in our CEQA review. Thank you very much. And I should mention, uh, we have um, reached out to all of the various regulatory agencies. Uh, some of the federal regulatory agencies have declined to participate. Doesn't mean they aren't working on their regulatory issues. Uh, doesn't mean we aren't in communication with them. Uh, but apparently, um, under the current administration, they're a little less inclined to be out at public meetings like this one. So I just want you to know that we have, no, in all seriousness, we've extended the invitation and, you know, they're people that uh, we've worked with in many cases over a number of years that they've just shared with us. Um, that's uh, not what we do at the moment. So there we, there we go with that. I should also mention, I see a few other elected officials or uh, offices that are represented. Vanessa, I'm sorry I missed you when you walked in the door from my colleague, Supervisor Dave Cortese's office. Appreciate Supervisor Cortese's office being represented here tonight. And Supervisor Jerry Hill's office, I believe I saw someone here. Yes, Lisa, thank you. Please tell Senator Hill that we did I call him S Senator Hill? I hope I did, State Senator Hill. Uh, we appreciate his presence as, uh, uh, through your personal participation. All right, um, one last thing before we go to the questions, and that is um, some of you have asked, we used to have them in the fall, now we have them in February, why is that? And the answer was so that we would sync these conversations, these hearings, with the twice annual meetings of the regulatory bodies. And in fact, this group of folks, or many of them, along with others, met just on February the 19th for one of their twice annual meetings. And so the thinking was that if we followed shortly thereafter with a public meeting like this, that the information would be timely, accurate, and we'd be sort of right on top of whatever the current state of play was. So let me just jump right in finally uh, and say, all right, for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, um, uh, it's my understanding that Lehigh is in the process of renewing what's called their Title V permit with um, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, sometimes called BACMED, believe it or not. Can you uh, provide uh, all of us with an update on the renewal process and explain what a Title V permit regulates? What is that? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, a Title V permit is a type of permit that we issue, one of many. 
Um, they can generally be classified as either a pre-construction review permit that allows a facility to build equipment or an operating permit that allows a facility to operate equipment. Um, we issue um, permits at local or district level and as well as federal level. Uh, once a facility has the potential to emit emissions above a certain threshold, it's required to get a federal operating permit. And this federal operating permit is called a Title V permit after the section of the Clean Air Act that, require, that lists its requirements. A Title V permit is required to be issued and renewed every five years, and it includes a listing of all the equipment at the facility, all applicable emission limits, and all applicable um, monitoring requirements. As part of the renewal process, we uh, solicit public feedback in a public comment period. We went through public comment period uh, for the Lehigh um, Title V renewal the end of last year, the end of October. However, uh, we became aware that our interested stakeholders list was a little outdated. So to allow for more public participation, we're going to go out for a second public comment period uh, that's anticipated to be the second or third week of March to end the third or fourth week of April. After the, we, the public comment period has ended, uh, we go send the, the uh, renewal to EPA. They have 45 days to review and then comment. After that period closes, we'll consider all the public comments we received, incorporating any changes necessary into the Title V, and then we'll issue a renewed Title V permit. All right. Um, before we move on to the next person, and actually the next question is going to be for you, just to give you a heads up. <laughs> Um, in layman's language, and some of you have been here before know I always try and ask folks to explain it in the simplest possible language, um, what does a Title V permit protect us against? So if somebody gets a Title V permit, we should be able to feel confident that what? Yeah, so the local individual permits are issued to the individual equipment. And it can get confusing but for facilities to understand all these particular requirements. A Title V permit requires all the applicable requirements to be put together into a single document. And it allows the facility to understand what they have to comply with, what are the emission limits, what are the um, testing requirements. I'm sorry, you said what are the emission limits? Correct. Okay. So is that something that people can and should feel more comfortable has been addressed if the permit has been issued? Yes. Okay, just um, also to. as part of the Title V permit, uh, in addition to our compliance activities that John may speak to later, facilities are required to self-report um, deviations and, we, and within 10 days and they also alert the public to what they've uh, found. Um, so there's more assurance of uh, compliance. Okay. Also for the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, let me ask you this. Could you explain with us how district staff investigate a complaint? So if you get a complaint, you receive a complaint from the public, and I know you do, could you tell us um, what you do with that? How do you handle that? And also, could you give us some sense of just how frequently you are routinely investigating the facility for compliance with your regulations at uh, the Air Quality District? So we get we get a lot of complaints, actually. Um, we got about 80 complaints during the past year for uh, alleging Lehigh Southwest as being uh, um, emitting some type of material or particulate, uh, et cetera. And so you call in complaints. We have a complaint line number, 1-800-334-ODOR, or 6367. And you talk with one of our dispatchers, or if it's after hours. So this is a 24-hour complaint line. So you can talk to uh, anyone at any time. You can also do it online and report a complaint. Well, those complaints will be dispatched to an inspector. An inspector should contact you, uh, should go to the facility and do an investigation to, to see whether or not there are any compliance issues. Uh, that are uh, at issue at Lehigh. If there are violations found, we will issue a notice of violation. Uh, the inspector will follow up usually and give you a call back and let you know uh, the status uh, of your complaint and what the results were. You can also um, tell the 
tell the inspector that you'd like a copy of the complaint and the complaint um, report will be sent to you uh, sometime later. So that's our complaints. Um, so the inspector's out there 80 times to do investigations on complaints. In addition to that, the inspector on average is out at the facility about three times a week. Um, they're out there to do compliance inspections. They're out there to check on complaints. They're out there to investigate uh, reportable compliance activities. That is, if Lehigh reports, self-reports a compliance problem, such as they're having a breakdown of some equipment, uh, they've had an excess uh, from one of their uh, emission points, an excess being something that's above the standard that they're required to meet, uh, the inspector will go out there and do an investigation, a report. Again, if there is a violation found, there may be a violation notice issued. We're also out there to do compliance assistance as well um, and to work with the facility to help them understand some of the terms and, and issues of their permit. Uh, so we're out there quite a bit um, and we're out there uh, on a routine and uh, very uh, frequent basis. You mentioned the possibility of a notice of violation being issued. Uh, the question I get a lot from my constituents is, okay, so a notice of violation is issued, so what? What happens then? What are the consequences, if any, of having a notice of violation issued? So a notice of violation starts a two, uh, it's a two-step process. First, the district's going to seek uh, compliance with the uh, violation itself. So uh, we're expecting the facility to uh, stop the violation. The second step of the process, of course, is a settlement process, and that started after compliance is, is achieved. Um, settlement process uh, can be uh, uh, short, it can be a long uh, process. Um, there's always questions about uh, the type of settlements that are, um, are, that are gotten from Lehigh, uh, but it's really, um, it's all about uh, making sure that the facility is complying with their permit. And if they're not, uh, then we'll issue a notice of violation, which will start that two-step process. Okay. Uncharacteristically, I may have been too tactful in my question, so let me try it again. <laughs> are there fines or penalties that are significant enough to make someone want to improve their behavior? And if so, would you tell us what they are? Give us a rough idea. Well, yes, there are fines, there are penalties, and uh, they are, we believe, sufficient enough to stop the behavior. Uh, of course, we're limited in the amount of uh, penalties that we can seek by the California Health and Safety Code, which sets uh, um, maximum penalties that we can uh, go after. Uh, for each and every violation. And, and those maximums are? Well, they can start at $5,000 and they can go way up. And the largest fine or penalty you can recall imposing at Lehigh over the last couple of years might be what, for example? I don't know. Uh, we're talking in the... I've seen them up around the 100000 mark. Okay. And for uh, folks, when there's a question that somebody can't respond to, and you know, I understand folks are not going to have every piece of information at their fingertips, um, as I'll mention again at the end, what we have been able to do the last couple of years is if there are unanswered questions, including just because we run out of time, we take all your question cards, we ask all of these people to answer them from the appropriate jurisdiction, and then we get them posted online so that you can access the answer to your question. It takes a little while, as you imagine, because if there are 20 or 30 unanswered questions, it's going to take time to get them to the right people and then get answers back and get them up online. But we do try and make sure that whatever we don't have time for tonight, we will get to. 
So there's our first one that I just tip you off is going to be coming your way, uh, <laughs> uh, and um, we'll take it from there. All right, then for the Regional Water Quality Control Board, could we ask what is the current status of compliance with the Water Board's water quality permits? The permits are issued. Uh, they have uh, various compliance obligations. So what's the current status of the compliance with Water Board water quality permits? And uh, could you share with uh, folks here how you ensure that there is ongoing compliance once the permits have been issued? Sure. Um, actually, compliance has been pretty good lately. Um, we have taken a number of enforcement actions, the last of which went through October uh, 1st, I think, of 2017. And um, th they were substantial penalties associated with those. And since then, um, we have not seen um, significant noncompliance with our permits. Uh, Lehigh has significantly reconfigured its site to better capture surface water and to direct process water to a new treatment system that removes selenium and other pollutants. And the selenium concentrations discharged from the treatment systems to Permanente Creek are now low enough to protect aquatic life. Um, there have been no major wastewater or stormwater overflows since the 2017-2018 wet season or so far this year, and this has been a wet one too. Um, and Lehigh continues to characterize its groundwater and prepare for eventual closure and reclamation in accordance with its permits. So you had also asked uh, what we do to track compliance. Well, uh, we have four different, we, the Water Board has five divisions and four of them are involved with Lehigh. So e each of those divisions has its own representatives that with frequent contact with Lehigh representatives. And we are reviewing reports that Lehigh sends us and deliverables <coughs> uh, and that includes sampling data and taking a look at that, providing feedback where it's warranted, giving them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, and we inspect the site. I know my division in particular inspects at least annually. And again, there are three other divisions who are, have a presence on the site. Thank you. And I heard the word substantial penalties. Um, I'm sure everybody in the room is wondering, what is your definition of substantial? Sorry, but I, well, I just got no, to there, there were a series of them, and um, they, the smallest, I think, was still over 300000 And I think if you added them all up, they're definitely over a million. That's as in dollars. Dollars. Thank you very US much. US dollars. OK, thank you very much. And um, let me just ask this question very directly for the Water Board. Are there currently any human health risks related to water quality associated with the site? Uh, as far as we know, no. Uh, the, the permit for surface water discharges ensures that such discharges are below the drinking water standards. And groundwater investigations indicate that the shallow groundwater at the site is not connected to the deeper groundwater aquifer that supplies drinking water. And we've also looked at monitoring data from the drinking water wells, and it uh, doesn't look like pollutants from the Lehigh site are getting into the drinking water wells. So um, we do continue to monitor um, water at the site, and, um, and, but so far we have not seen any evidence of a human health risk. All right, I want to follow up on water and go to the water district in just a moment, but let me just ask, not so much me, but for the panelists, can folks in the back of the room hear all right, or do we need to ask our folks to speak up a little? Are we doing okay? They're, they're doing okay. All right. All right. Then for the water district, let me ask this. Um, the folks in my district are often uh, concerned. They tell me about the possibility of contaminants like selenium that was mentioned getting into the groundwater and then getting into the drinking water. Um, if that's a concern people have, what would the water district like them to know? Well, um, we have also monitored the groundwater that is used for drinking water and have found no indication of elevated selenium, mercury, or arsenic. And um, it is also these metals uh, don't move readily through soils. So soils are uh, a good treatment method and they don't migrate deep to impact water supply wells. So um, we've reviewed data and have found no elevated levels. All right. I'm going to ask folks in the audience to refrain from noise making, whether they're supportive or otherwise here, please. Let me at stay with the water district, though, for a minute and say, I think that sometimes the overlapping jurisdiction between the Water District and the Regional Water Quality Control Board can be confusing for folks. Is there an easy way for the public to understand who to go to with which concerns? 
Yes, of course. Um, so the Santa Clara Valley Water District does not have any regulatory or legal authority over Lehigh Cement. Um, we are the local subject matter experts that consult with the county and um, the regional board on groundwater and surface water matters, but uh, we ourselves do not have that type of authority. Okay. We do have a pollution hotline, so if there anyone sees pollution going into a creek, that is a 24-hour number that can be called. Um, so we, we do uh, care about our water quality, but we don't have that regulatory authority. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to go now to our county planning staff, and these are folks who are at Santa Clara County uh, in the planning department. And, uh, you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, the increased truck traffic recently on city streets has led to a significant uptick in the number of complaints received not only at the county but also at the city. Uh, could you tell folks here your understanding of what led to that and how the county has responded and perhaps equally important what the next steps are going to be? Sure, absolutely. And tell everybody again who you are, please. Rob Eastwood, manager of the Plain Office. I know this is probably a, a topic that's of a lot of interest tonight and as you mentioned earlier, uh, Supervisor Submitting. Uh, our understanding in sometime last year, uh, likely the spring summer, both uh, Lehigh and Stevens Creek entered into a business arrangement where a, um, a waste material that's not limestone at Lehigh was being sold to Stevens Creek. Uh, the original method in which that was delivered uh, was through what's called an internal haul road. That's how we've referenced it. Uh, Lehigh had built a road. Uh, you'll notice the two quarries are next to each other, but over Ridgeline, they had built a road that connects uh, Lehigh to Stevens Creek uh, that previously was not there. It was previously a PG&E road, and it was widened to be used by quarry trucks. Uh, so for a certain period of time, uh, Lehigh was delivering material to Stevens Creek. Uh, again, this is not the limestone that's used in cement production. It's what's called greenstone, uh, and previously Lehigh had been uh, selling a crushed product on the market, uh, but instead was selling a raw product of greenstone uh, to Stevens Creek. Uh, in summer of last year, our inspectors, uh, Supervisor Smitty in reference, boots on the ground, we do monthly inspections, uh, observed, and had actually heard uh, from others uh, of this activity. Uh, once the county had uh, verified uh, that the, the hall road, the internal hall road, uh, had been installed, uh, we issued what's called a notice of violation of SMARA. Uh, as Supervisor Smitty mentioned, uh, Lehigh does have vested rights to legal non-conforming quarry. Uh, however, to do any new disturbance of land, any new activity, uh, you need to have a reclamation plan uh, that confirms that that activity will be reclaimed and restored afterwards, and that hall road had not. Uh, so our violation uh, told Lehigh to stop its activity, uh, to uh, submit a, a reclamation plan that would restore that road, and if Lehigh intended to use that road or use an additional road to apply for a reclamation plan. Our understanding is, is after that, Lehigh did stop using the internal hall road. Uh, the result, however, as probably most in the community know, uh, that they started to use uh, public roads. And I believe, if I recall right, the the, the, the means of conveyance uh, was down Stevens Creek Boulevard, uh, a right turn, I believe, at uh, Foothill, and then up Stevens Canyon Boulevard. And for several months, uh, through the city of Cupertino and many community members, and some might remember a community meeting in December, uh, both, I believe, the city of Cupertino and ourselves heard uh, many complaints regarding that truck traffic. Uh, we looked top to bottom at the permits of both quarries to verify uh, by delivering that material via city streets, was there any violations? And the realization we came to, uh, which was in February of this year, in coordination with our code enforcement staff and code enforcement council, uh, that there was a violation. It was not on the Lehigh side of the transaction. It was on the Stevens Creek Quarry side of the transaction. Uh, Stevens Creek Quarry operates under what are called mediated conditions. They're very much like a use permit. They are approved by the Board of Supervisors in the early 2000s. Uh, they do not allow the importation, crushing, and reselling of the material on Stevens Creek at the parcel in which it was happening. Um, they're allowed to do surface mining, um, but that activity itself of importing rock, crushing it, reselling on the market uh, was a violation of the conditions that the county had issued to Stevens Creek Quarry. Uh, following this determination, we issued a notice of violation uh, to Stevens Creek Quarry, uh, telling them to cease and desist this activity. Uh, that was issued, I believe, on February 15th. Uh, I might have, I hope I have the date right. Uh, to our understanding, I'd check with inspectors and others in the office, uh, and perhaps community members might know more, but we do not have any evidence that the activity has continued, uh, that the truck traffic has stopped. And so that's the current state of things. All right. 
And uh, other than the truck issue, are there other things that the county has been involved in recently at Lehigh that it makes sense to share with the community tonight? Uh, just a few things. No, most aren't new news. Uh, folks might know for some time there have been ongoing legacy issues, as mentioned by the, the regional board staff regarding Selenium. Uh, part of the county's role has been to do ongoing monitoring of runoff from what's called the East Material Storage Area. This might be the most visible part of the quarry. Uh, for some time, the stormwater runoff from that area was entering into Permanente Creek. There were high levels of selenium. In the county's 2012 reclamation plan, there was a requirement that, the, that Lehigh continue to evaluate and determine how to manage and treat that uh, selenium runoff. And last year, uh, Lehigh had developed uh, a treatment plant to treat selenium. Most, was, most of that treatment plant was used to treat selenium water from the quarry pit. However, as of, as of last year, Lehigh reported to the, the county and the planning commission that they were taking water that was running off of that east material storage area and they were connecting it to the, uh, the treatment plant. And that was good news. That was reported to our planning commission uh, last year and that's something the, the county has been tracking. Uh, last but not least, count, uh, Lehigh is um, required to restore Permanente Creek. This comes out of a settlement agreement uh, of a lawsuit between the Sierra Club and Lehigh Quarry. Uh, the parts, what's the county's role in this? Uh, Lehigh has applied for a grading permit to go in and restore a creek. It requires grading. Uh, county's a lead, lead land use agency that, that issues that. So we've been somewhat of a clearinghouse agency. Uh, we're not creek restoration experts, but we've been working with uh, Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, the regional board on processing that grading permit uh, that will restore permanent, permanent creek uh, to what it was before a lot of waste materials were put in permanent creek. And we've had a number of questions off and on over the last year as to whether or not Lehigh has plans to proceed with a, quote, new pit on the site. What, if anything, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I know that <clears throat> that term would raise a lot of uh, interest in this community and, uh, and has before. Uh, what I can tell you is, is some past conversations uh, with the administrative staff at Lehigh have indicated uh, they, at some point, in the future uh, have an intent uh, to probably look at a new pit. Uh, they've indicated as such, I've heard uh, secondarily that they are starting uh, some outreach meetings with the community. Um, with respect to county staff, uh, they have not indicated us or submitting any permits or pre-applications to start that process. So the community knows uh, if Lehigh was to propose a second pit, at minimum it requires a permit process. Uh, that permit will be dictated on where that pit is and the type of activity. As uh, Supervisor Smidian mentioned earlier, portions of this site are vested, which means they're legal non-conforming, which means mining and surface mining can happen without a use permit. Uh, if the new pit was to be located in those areas, and if the county was to verify that the type of mining and activity was consistent with Lehigh's vested rights, uh, then the permit would only be a reclamation plan, uh, which provides less discretion, I'll say, to the county uh, to approve or deny the, 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 the new pit. If it's in an area that is not vested geographically or if it's of a nature that's out, not in compliance with its vested rights, it would require a use permit. And in those instances, as many may know, uh, the discretion of the county is much broader. It has the option to approve or deny or, or much broadly condition how that surface mining happens. Um, so to reiterate, to, uh, to date, Lehigh has not applied uh, for a new pit. They have not indicated uh, what we require first is a pre-application submittal uh, to get feedback on a new pit, uh, but I have uh, heard their staff mention that it will be, uh, it, it's something they're looking at in the future, and I have heard that they are starting to uh, perhaps arrange meetings with the community to talk about uh, that proposal. Thank you. Let me uh, move now to our county council's office, and for those of you who are not familiar with the structure, county council is basically the lawyers for the county. That's what county council is. And um, we have first uh, Elizabeth Bianca. Ms. Bianca, could you uh, review briefly the disposition of the lawsuits around the 2011 and 2012 actions on vested rights and the rec plan? And I should just mention before I let you answer, when I mentioned the vested rights and the reclamation plan, I saw about half the audience nod knowingly and the other half scrunch their foreheads like, what on earth is he talking about? So I think it may be helpful to just briefly explain what these things are, why they matter, and what the argument was about, and then how did things turn out in the court? 
So you have 30 seconds, by the way. So. <laughs> Thank you. Just kidding. Just so kidding. Supervisor uh, Simidian stated in his introductory remarks, um, in 2011, the board um, made a vested rights determination for the scope of the vested rights for Lehigh. And at a very high level, uh, what vested rights means is that um, a use can continue to operate without a use permit. Um, and in the case of Lehigh, there was uh, sufficient evidence in the record to determine that um, Lehigh had vested rights to uh, operate a uh, surface mining operation. Um, that determination was challenged uh, first in Superior Court and then was appealed in the Sixth District Court of Appeal. Um, and the county prevailed both in Superior Court um, and in the Sixth District. And so that vested rights determination for certain parcels on Lehigh's property stands. Um, the second action that was mentioned was the Board of Supervisors' approval of a reclamation plan um, amendment uh, for Lehigh in 2012. And so all quarries that operate in uh, the state of California must have a reclamation plan. Um, and at a high level, again, what the reclamation plan does is that ensures that when the quarry eventually stops operating, that the land will be reclaimed and that there's measures and steps that are taken for that reclamation. Um, the board's action, both to certify the environmental impact report for the reclamation plan, as well as uh, the adoption of the plan, was challenged uh, both in Superior Court and in the Court of Appeals. Um, and the county prevailed at both levels, and um, that uh, reclamation plan has been upheld, as well as the board certification of the EIR. Ms. Bianca, just to be clear, the fact that something was held to be legal doesn't necessarily mean it was good policy. That's a policy judgment that the Board of Supervisors made at the time, yes? Correct. And I just, I, I point that out because I often have people who say, well, I still think it's a bad idea because, to which I say, fair enough, the five members of the Board of Supervisors who were there at the time made the decision about the reclamation plan, made the decision about vested rights, and what the court decides is not were those good decisions or bad decisions, but were they legal decisions. And what Ms. Bianca is telling us is that they were legal decisions, whether any one of us in the room agrees or disagrees with the merits of the decision. And I hope that distinction is, is clear. Um, but, you know, there's legal and uh, not legal, but that's a different set of, of topics and conversations sometimes than was it a good idea or the right call to make. Uh, Mr. Rossi, uh, who is seated immediately next door there, uh, also from our County Council's office, my recollection is you handle code enforcement issues. So could you explain to our constituents here the basis for the August notice of violation at uh, Lehigh and the February notice of violation at Stevens Creek Quarry, and perhaps uh, share with everybody as well some explanation of what happens if the uh, directives in the notice of violation aren't complied with. Sure. So as uh, Mr. Eastwood said, uh, the August... And I think we need you into that microphone, please, sir. There we go. As Mr. Eastwood said, uh, the August NOV dealt with an unpermitted haul road that was graded between Stevens Creek Quarry and Lehigh Quarry for the transfer of materials between the two. As the result of the county issuing that notice of violation, Lehigh... Uh, stopped importing the material to uh, the Stevens Creek Quarry. Uh, as to the February notice of violation that had to do with Stevens Creek's illegal importation of aggregate for processing and um, resale, it exceeded their uh, allowed use. Uh, upon issuance of that notice of violation, Stevens Creek also ceased uh, the illegal activity. It, generally speaking, the county has several options uh, when it issues a notice of violation. If the notice of violation goes unheeded, uh, the county can initiate administrative fines. It can enter into a compliance agreement with the responsible party. It can file a civil action and seek injunctive relief. Uh, in this particular case, uh, had Stevens Creek Quarry uh, failed to heed the county's notice of violation, we would have uh, initiated fines of $1,000 per day per violation. We were informed that there were 168 truckloads going from 
Lehigh Quarry to Stevens Creek Quarry that would have resulted in a daily fine of $168,000. Uh, in addition, if we were forced to bring a civil action to enforce uh, because the activity ceased, we would have the uh, option of requesting the court order uh, a $2,500 per day nuisance abatement fine, which would have resulted in daily fines of approximately $420,000. Thank you. Let me move on to the city of Cupertino now. And um, Mr. Lee, thank you for joining us. And uh, also, again, thank you to the city for hosting us here tonight. Um, last year, uh, Lehigh and the Stevens Creek Quarry began moving the materials between their two facilities on city streets. And uh, as has been mentioned now a couple of times, we know that resulted in uh, impacts to Cupertino residents that you heard about. Uh, could you give us an overview of those impacts and how the city of Cupertino exercised its jurisdiction over city streets? Because the city streets are not county roads, they are city streets. Yes, absolutely. I'm Roger Lee. Yeah, so as soon as the county, um, you know, stopped the hauling on the internal hall road, you know, the city without notice, uh, we started to receive phone calls because a great number of trucks started to use the city streets. And, and I think at one time it was at least 40, 40 plus trucks were running on the streets. And, you know, the residents that, that live along that corridor, it wasn't a normal kind of truck traffic that anyone was used to. And so, you know, we were getting calls of congestion, um, concerns just about safety, not only to uh, the cars, but to cyclists and to pedestrians, uh, particularly at the intersection at Stevens Creek Boulevard and Foothill. Um, we also had concerns uh, with dust, uh, with debris hitting the road. So these were all concerns that we were hearing and we were hearing them pretty, pretty frequently and loudly. Um, as a result of that, we had the county, uh, the county sheriff out there, you know, monitoring the intersection, you know, doing, doing what they could and we could to, you know, make sure that the traffic laws were being obeyed at that, at that intersection. Because I think as many of you know, it's just not configured to handle that size of vehicles uh, moving in those types of patterns. And it was, uh, it also caused uh, some particular issues during the morning commute hours uh, because as the, as the trucks were returning empty to, to go and get refilled at Stevens Creek Quarry, they were queuing up in that left turn lane on northbound Foothill to turn west on Stevens Creek Boulevard. And it didn't take but a, a couple trucks to, uh, to fill up that turn lane and then, and then impede the through northbound traffic on the Foothill. And in the morning, you know, it's already a congested area and it only made things worse. Um, so we, we, we did have a community meeting on uh, December the 19th so that uh, you know, all of our residents that were potentially impacted by that would have a, an idea of why this was occurring and what had changed. And um, by a show of hands, about how, how many of you were at the December 19th meeting? Um, you had? And, and we had about this many people at that meeting, if, uh, for those of you that were there. And uh, the purpose of that meeting was to to let our residents know what the responsibilities were of the county, which you know you're hearing more about that tonight, what uh, about that of the city, and and really just how to keep up to date on this issue, what the next public meetings are, so that you can be involved and, and just have a voice in, in what's going to be happening next. Um, you know, and, and and while this was happening, you know, following up with both Stevens Creek Quarry and with Lehigh to to just see what could be worked out to help help the issues. Can we, can we get those, those loads covered? Um, can we reduce the number of trucks? Can we not have the trucks there of a morning and uh, when the commute traffic is heavy? And um, while those things were discussed, it just wasn't moving as quickly as, as we thought our residents uh, had expected it to move. And uh, that was really the impetus as to why the city had written the, uh, you know, the rather lengthy and, um, letter to the county uh, you know, detailing what we thought needed to have happen, and also just to be a, a conscience as to, you know, what, what we saw was happening at both Stevens Creek Quarry and, and Lehigh. And that's how we got to where we were and, and are today. Thank you. And let me just uh, say, prior to the issue of the trucks using the city street, um, as we heard earlier, there were improvements made to an internal PG&E access road on the site that connects the two facilities. And as um, county staff shared, the county issued a notice of violation associated with the improvements on the Lehigh property. But um, I believe that uh, there are portions of that road that are within the jurisdiction of the city of Cupertino. 
could you clarify that for us? Because I've had folks who have been asking, wait a minute, is it in the county jurisdiction, the city jurisdiction, or how would you answer that? Well, the, the, so, yes. Go ahead. So the, uh, the, the road that was, you know, illegally graded that connects the two quarries, um, it predominantly is within the county's jurisdiction. However, there is a, a portion that's, um, it's, it's just it measured in just a few acres that, that does cross into the city's city limits. It's not, it's not city owned land, but it is lands within the city. And, and as such, you know, as any, as any of you that own property in the city, if you, if you make certain improvements, you, you need to get a permit to do that work. Well, that, that was not done. Um, but the, the access road has, has predated all this and it was there. Um, and and that, that portion um, and to an area south of about 12 acres, uh, there, there is an existing agreement between the city and the county um, for the uh, implementation of SMARA, the Service Mining and Reclamation Act that, uh, that Rob mentioned, and for CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, compliance. Uh, because the city, that's, that's, not, that's not something that we're well versed in. And, and so we have a 2008 agreement that, that allowed the county, allows the county to implement those regulations relative to that slice of land that is within the jurisdiction of the city. Um, now, the purpose of that agreement is, is for a, it's called a slope layback area. It is, uh, it is not for an internal haul road. And, uh, and as such, um, you know, that, that agreement would, would have to be changed, uh, you know, by our city council to allow any other use other than that. So we have federal jurisdiction, we have state jurisdiction, we have county jurisdiction, and we have city jurisdiction as well as jurisdiction by various regional bodies and agencies, just to give folks a sense of what part of the challenge is here. Um, let me go to county environmental health, and again, this is a county, Santa Clara County uh, Department or agency. Um, Ms. Gaddy, thank you again for being here. As I recall, last year when we met, Lehigh had just changed out the fans in the cement plant exhaust system in the hopes that that would reduce noise impacts, and that was an issue that We'd had some back and forth on over a period of time. Uh, could you let us know what your ongoing monitoring program is telling us about how well that is working? The installation of the 32 fans, the replacement of the 32 fans, has proven effective in resolving the noise issue at Lehigh. We continued our monitoring activities in the year 2018, and there were no exceedances of the noise limits set forth in the county ordinance code, and there were no notices of violations issued to Lehigh in 2018. My recollection is that there were two or three notices of violation previously as to various noise exceedances going over the limit, yes? Yes, between 2016 and 2017, there were three notices of violations issued for th five instances of exceedances at, at Lehigh. But since the new fan? There have been no exceedances and no notices of violation. Right. Let me stay with uh, County Environmental Health and uh, rather than mangle your last name, Jennifer, let me just say Jennifer. Um, my recollection is that you inspect some of the hazardous materials facilities uh, and that those are annual inspections. Um, others are inspected even you know, less frequently. Could I ask and could you share with everybody here, how often do you expect, inspect the Lehigh facility? And when you go, what are you looking for? What are you there to inspect? And are there any results that you could share with us from your most recent inspections? Sure, there are various reasons why we would be out at the, the Lehigh facility. And in fact, there are several different programs that we're implementing out there. And it's really the programs and the inspection mandates established by the state and federal laws that, that determine what our inspection frequency is. Um, so in short, we're actually, we are out there annually for routine inspections of their underground storage tanks. We're out there more frequently when we have construction projects that relate to hazardous materials. Um, so lately we've been out there quite, quite a bit uh, related to the installation of the new uh, selenium treatment plant uh, for the, the rainwater coming off of the plant. And while the the influent to, to that system, the concentrations of selenium there would not classify it as a hazardous material for us. What they're using to help um, eliminate the selenium from that discharge is considered a hazardous material. 
So we're out there to take a look at whether the tanks that are holding those materials are compatible, um, whether they're structurally sound, whether there's secondary containment, um, any of the piping also needs to be sound and secondarily contained, and that there's a lot of monitoring to make sure that those chemicals do not get released to the environment, that they are either consumed or used in the process and not discharged. Um, but with regard to the routine inspections, like I said, we are out at the uh, underground storage tank uh, facility on an annual basis. So they do store fuels, just like most gas stations, in tanks that are below, uh, below grade. Because they're in such close proximity to um, you know, the ground and, and groundwater, those tanks are regulated pretty highly uh, with uh, advanced monitoring systems to make sure that those fuels do not get into, into the ground. Um, so that we are out there annually. The rest of the campus has different programs that we're looking at, and most of those programs have a three-year inspection cycle. So we group all of those inspection frequency, those inspections together. And we're in the process of finishing up uh, one of the more thorough sweeps through the entire uh, campus. We break it down into about 17 individual either buildings or operational areas, and each one has different types of you know, amounts that they're storing, types of permits that they need. Um, and we, a lot of our violations get classified in different ways. We have things that are called minor violations um, that are not, they're, they're more paperwork in nature. They're not supposed to uh, provide any significant financial benefit and there's no significant harm to the environment. And because a lot of the things we're doing are prevention related, we do have a lot of those types of, of violations. Then we have violations that are major violations, that are an immediate threat to, to human health and the environment. And then there's this middle ground. Um, minor violations, if they correct those violations within 30 days, we have no ability to do enforcement under the state law. The moderate violations, we have some discretion, and the major violations are ones where we're encouraged to do some type of escalated enforcement. What I can say right now is there's, uh, as we're just finishing up the round of inspections out there, we are finding violations, which is typical of our inspections, um, but the vast majority of them are the minor violations. And so far, like 10 or so are these moderate violations um, that we're going to allow them the, the chance if they think that they, one, didn't have that violation, they can submit additional information. Um, but if not, we'll give them the opportunity to correct those. At this time, there are no significant, uh, the, the class one violations. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, let me go to uh, folks who are here from State Fish and Wildlife, and thank you again for being here, Mr. Waveman. Um, my understanding is that the wildlife agencies have been weighing in on the recent creek restoration plans for Permanente Creek. Uh, could you share with us what you think uh, the public might like to know about where that effort stands and any concern that the state may have at this point with the restoration effort or other issues? Okay. Um, so the state, we've been working a lot with the county um, through the grading permit. Uh, the creek restoration from our point um, requires a lake and stream bed alteration agreement. It's to known to some as our it's, uh, fish and game code 1600. And so we've been really working with the county and the designs um, that have come through that grading plan to ensure that the, the stream is stable, that um, it promotes riparian habitat and promotes the fish and wildlife resources. And I really want to compliment the county um, for working with us. You know, we, once we get into application, uh, it's really important that the material that we have in front of us is good. And they've really been, um, been a good partner in making sure that we're getting good information. And so we um, engaged our engineering department as well as our, as our fisheries biologist to really take a look at this plan. And um, I, like I said, I think that the, the um, big thing that we want to see is that, you know, this is a, quite a steep area, and so it is a complicated restoration project, so we're really taking a deep dive into that. Um, I think another, you know, aspect of this is endangered species, and at the State Fish and Wildlife, um, the species, we do not regulate the California red-legged frog or, or steelhead trout or others, and so really the Fish and Wildlife Service would, um, the, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, would really take the lead in the in the endangered species part, and then we would um, 
follow their lead as we uh, permit through our, our lake and stream bed program. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I wanna just mention, I saw um, Patrick Ahrens from Assembly Member Evan Lowe's office has joined us. Thank you very much. Appreciate the Assembly Member's interest. And I also saw that our Vice Mayor, Liang Fang Chao is here. I think I still see her through the plate class in the back. Thank you, there she is. Thank you very much for joining us. I really do uh, think it's noteworthy that so many uh, of our locally electeds and uh, the state and federal representatives have uh, sort of made the effort to be here and to pay attention. I'm gonna to go to questions from you all and we're gonna march through as many of these as quickly as we can uh, in the time that remains. And again, to the extent we can't get to all the questions, uh, I apologize, but it just time does not permit. Um, and uh, thank you for the crisp handwriting. That helps make it a little bit easier. Um, so let me just ask, uh, the first batch is on water and then I'll go to air. Uh, and then we'll go to some other topics. But uh, water question. Uh, and by the way, when I read the question, if the question makes a certain statement of fact or an assertion, I'm not saying that. The questioner is saying that, okay? So I, I can't vouch for the accuracy of anything that's in any of the questions one way or the other. I'm just reading the questions. It says, um, there are two water treatment facilities on Lehigh property. What percentage of pit water is treated at the upper elevation facility? I do not know the percentage that treated at the upper versus the lower facility. So is that one we should come back to you on uh, and get an answer later? Uh, I don't mean tonight, but I mean uh, for posting on the website? Sure, we'd be happy to look into it. All right, well then let me go to another question from the same questioner and see if we can um, get an answer here. How will water quality of Stevens Reservoir and Stevens Creek be tested and for how long? How will we know if there's been an increase in mercury in Stevens Reservoir as a result of some of the material transferred to Stevens Quarry? I think there's a couple questions in there. There are. <laughs> First one is, how will water quality of Stevens Reservoir and Stevens Creek be tested and for how long? Feel free. Um, we test Stevens Creek Reservoir at least monthly for mercury um, and twice a month in the summer. We have an existing program in that reservoir to try and control mercury from turning into methylmercury, which is taken up by the food web. Uh, mercury is uh, not a drinking water concern because it binds to soil quickly and can be treated in a drinking water uh, treatment plant as well. Um, but we do go out there at least monthly, if not bi-monthly, to look for mercury. and. Um, uh, the indication is that the materials transported to Stevens Creek Quarry did not contain mercury or selenium. All right, thank you. Next question is, uh, and again it begins with a statement, Lehigh is shipping materials to Stevens Creek Quarry, Quarry, excuse me, Lehigh is shipping materials to Stevens Creek Quarry. Are there water standards uh, to monitor water quality since there is not a water control plant at Stevens Creek Quarry? Well, I think that the first thing that we should understand is that the, the rock that was being transferred over to Stevens Creek Quarry was greenstone and as opposed to limestone. And it's the limestone that contains the selenium that we've generally been, generally been concerned about at the Lehigh site. So um, we're, ne we're not concerned about the water quality related to greenstone. We do have an industrial stormwater permit at the Stevens Creek Quarry and that permit requires monitoring and we are, um, and, and it requires that the Stevens Creek Quarry implement best management practices in order to keep pollutants down and we're evaluating the results of the monitoring data. Okay, uh, question for the State Regional Water Quality Control Board. Why are you waiting until May 2019 to require Stevens Creek Quarry to provide you with water tests of their dammed ponds? That's D-A-M-M-E-D, -M -M -E just to be clear. <laughs> and just to be clear, I'm with the Regional Water Board, and it was the Regional Water Board issued what we call a 13267 letter, which is a, an, a type of order where we, uh, under the, the state water code, where we require information be submitted to us. And so we have required a, a number of different kinds of monitoring uh, be done and reported to us and, um, and 
it takes time to go collect the samples and it takes time for the samples to be you know, analyzed and it takes time to put the report together. So um, that was a, a deadline that we thought was reasonable. Okay. Uh, the question is, is water qual are water quality samples evaluated even when people do not complain? And are the results available? And do you do trending analysis? So in terms of how you handle these uh, test, uh, are there uh, samples and evaluations even when folks have not complained? Are the results available somewhere? And do you do trending analysis? Yes, we um, evaluate data whether there are complaints or not. Our regulatory programs are in place and um, they require sampling and, and, um, and we evaluate the data that comes out of that. Um, we, um, the, the, the data are public documents so um, if there's something in particular that someone is interested in, they can always contact the water board and we can connect them with the actual data that they're looking for. Um, much of the data, depending on, on uh, what the nature of it is, it could be found in various publicly available databases. But I would recommend actually contacting someone at the water board um, to help you navigate that and then we can kind of hook you up with the, the publicly available data. Um, I don't know that we regularly look at trends per se, but if there's a concern um, related to a site over the long term, that the, the data are available, and we, we um, if that's something that we're interested in, we would look at trends. For instance, at the Lehigh site, um, you know, we are we're certainly tracking data from their effluent quality, so we we know that it was that the concentrations were higher, and we know that they're lower now. Okay. Question for the water boards. Can you please create a web page and email list for Stevens Creek Quarry as you have for Lehigh? I think we can do that. Okay. If I ask you again in 30 seconds, will you be even more sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't control the, the, our web postings, but it seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to ask for, and we have a web page for Lehigh, and, it's, and I think we can create one for Stevens Creek. Thank you, and thank you for letting me put you on the spot a little bit. I appreciate it. And then the um, question is phrased this way. Selenium in Permanente Creek, is it still there? There was selenium in Permanente Creek. Is it still there? That's yes. The and anything more you can share than that in terms of uh, amounts, for example? Well, you know, selenium is a material that persists in the environment, and so if there were there, there are there's naturally occurring selenium in the environment. There's naturally occurring selenium in the the, the rock nearby, and of course there were selenium containing discharges. So the selenium is in the creek. The creek is um, listed as, and this is water board jargon, but it's listed as a, an impaired water body, meaning it, it, it that there was evidence at least at one time that it didn't meet water quality standards for selenium. And we are embarking on a project to address that um, through, and again, more water board jargon, a TMDL or a total maximum daily load, which is a fancy way of saying a water quality control plan that that will um, monitor what's happening with the selenium and make sure that it gets down below water quality standards. Right now, I uh, have not looked at the data, so I don't know what the current status is, but uh, I do know that uh, the intention is to use the upcoming reissuance of our surface water permit as uh, the tool to make sure that all the actions necessary to protect the creek are in place. Um, and I think the other thing that I would just like to add, though, is that our, what we'll be doing is making sure that the selenium concentrations are below the water quality standards. Um, we will not be eliminating selenium because that's not something you can do in a, with a naturally occurring substance. Um, selenium is, a, is actually even essential to life as a trace element, but we'll be making sure that the concentrations are low enough that it doesn't harm aquatic life. Okay. Uh, for Cupertino and for the Bay Area Air Quality Management uh, District, what is being done or can be done to reduce the impact of diesel particulate matter on Cupertino residents? Uh, 
Well, that's a loaded question. I mean, it's, it's basically... <laughs> Actually, I took some of the load out of the question, so... Um... <laughs> Go to it. The particulate matter from diesel is, is from the trucks. We actually don't have a regulatory authority over those trucks, but what we have done in the past and what we can continue to do is we have grant programs that will uh, help uh, truck owners to upgrade their, their trucks to get better quality engines and that release less diesel particulate. Um, we have limits on the number of trucks that can go in and out of Lehigh for certain processes. Uh, they're not near those limits at the moment, um, so that's not something that we can um, uh, do anything about to reduce. Uh, we're continually looking at any types of permits that they might be submitting to us that might uh, increase truck traffic. And those things uh, we take very uh, seriously and uh, they will be looked at um, and scrutinized so that the diesel particulate uh, is not uh, increased for the area. But as to, um, basically truck traffic, we really don't have much authority over that. Which I think is um, part of the reason the question was addressed as well to the city. Any comment from the city on this, understanding that it, in one sense it's an air quality question, in another sense it's a question about di diesel traffic. I don't, I don't really know what I would add to All that. Right. We, can, we can ask for a follow-up on this one when we uh, circulate unanswered questions and uh, try and get answers for you up online. Uh, staying with air quality for a few minutes, will the relaxation of EPA standards for coal-fired power plants emissions result in increased emissions at Lehigh? Well, um, they shouldn't. Uh, we implement, in addition to federal standards, we have our local standards or permit standards, which are typically much more restrictive and more stringent uh, than federal standards. Uh, we also require continuous emission monitors, parametric monitors, which are monitors or kind of surrogates, and source testing. And so those emission limits should still remain in place. All right. For the Air District, you mentioned 80 violations complaints. How many were determined to result in a notice of violation? So I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I know at least one did this summer uh, because uh, it was a complaint about visible emissions and we ended up issuing a notice of violation about visible emissions from the uh, large stack at Lehigh. Um, I would say generally most of the complaints do not result in notices of violation. I'd say the great majority do not uh, result in notices of violation. Okay. And here's another one, and I'm just looking to my own office now, where we can uh, see if we can get uh, a little more precise answer when you have time to take a look at the data if that's possible. Next question is, how does one provide comments for the Title V permit with Backman? Yes, there's multiple uh, ways that we post on our website. You can submit a comment uh, through the website, uh, through email. Um, you can um, drop them off at our office or mail them uh, to our office as well. Okay. Next question. Why is Lehigh allowed to operate their kiln on spare the air days? Because it's perfectly legal. Um, and it does, it, it makes a lot of sense if you could shut down the kiln on spare the air days. However, there's a couple different programs that we have spare the air for. In the wintertime we have wintertime spare the air, which is for particulate matter. Uh, that's usually what we're trying to do is limit the air pollution from wood burning stoves and fireplaces. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to shut down the kiln. Um, 
During the summer, the uh, emphasis is more on ozone pollution. And again, uh, shutting, down the plume, uh, shutting down the kiln is not something that uh, we have the authority to do or we would like to do. Uh, this is a very large kiln. It's not something you can turn on and off at will. It takes time. Uh, so it, it's not really something that you can just turn on and off uh, willy-nilly. I do want to go back to the diesel particulate one because uh, I do want to say one thing. Although the Bay Area Air Quality does not have any authority over the diesel particulates from these uh, diesel trucks, the California Air Resources Board does. And so, and I, there's nobody here from the California Air Resources Board, um, but they do have a, a, a big program involved in reducing uh, diesel per particulate emission from uh, trucks. Uh, so that's something I just want people to be aware of. Okay. The next question reads, every Sunday a large cloud of black smoke rises from the Lehigh facility. My guess is that the effluent from Lehigh is measured as an average. The Sunday black smoke looks much more concentrated. Should I avoid outside activities on Sundays when contaminants appear to be far above average? So. I would recommend that uh, if this is a Sunday regular occurrence that uh, an air pollution complaint be called in so that we can have an inspector uh, be there and observe this, uh, this uh, black smoke or black dust uh, so that we can find out what it is because we, I'm curious and I think uh, we would be very, very interested in finding out what it is. We don't know. All right, I've got a card that says, just concerned because in the early AM, when I go outside, the air smells like another planet. Anybody got a reaction to that? There is a question mark at the end of it, so I, uh, I'll frame it in the form of a question, as they say on Jeopardy. Okay. Uh, my guess is it's not, uh, it's not a smell that's coming from Lehigh Southwest. Okay. And... <sighs> Next question is, when there is a complaint to the Bay Area Air Quality District, can the inspector go onto the property or can they be held at the guard station for an extended time? Uh, we insist uh, with the facility that the inspector be let in and uh, we have had no problems uh, with an inspector being held at the gate. Okay. Question is, how is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District's Lehigh inspector paid for? Is it the taxpayers or Lehigh? Well, all facilities uh, through their permitting pay us. So the Air District receives funds from permitting through all sources in the Bay Area. Well, we receive funds from property taxes we receive state subvention funds, we receive funds from the federal EPA. Um, so I guess you could make a case that some of those funds are from Lehigh, but it really is not true. Um, it's, we have a general fund that pays through out for our inspection staff. Uh, some money is paid through by Lehigh through the permitting system, but every other facility in the district also contributes. Okay, I'm going to move to, again, we have lots more of those uh, questions, but I want to make sure we get to the different topics. So I'm going to go to uh, planning now, and let me see what we've got here. We have lots. Let me let those go. So, are there, for planning, are there minutes from your twice yearly meetings with regulatory agencies, and can they be made public? My recollection, and, and again, unfortunately I was out of the town for the last meeting, but our practice has been to keep general notes of the meeting. Um, given that the, the intent of the meeting is for the different regulatory agencies to share notes, uh, compare notes, make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes. It's not a public meeting, it's not intended. Um, 
to focus on uh, releasing information to the public. That's actually the intent of this meeting. Uh, we don't keep notes that are intended to release to the public. Again, it's just a, a sharing and collaboration meeting. So uh, those notes are not uh, made available. All right. We've got a card here from someone, and this is not a question. It's a proposal, which is expedite the permits to build the road between the two quarries. And um, just to be clear here, we've got what some people call the PG&E road, that was the road that was, quote, improved, expanded, and that was uh, the subject of a notice of violation back in August of 2018, yes? That is correct. Okay, then we have the city roads, which were subsequently used once the notice of violation went out for the old PG, old PG and E road. Yes, city roads? That is correct. Okay. Then there is a third road that has been proposed, or route, I guess I should say, that has been proposed. And uh, we had an application at the county for a different road over the Lehigh property, as I recall. Um, what's the status of that before we get back to this? Sure, absolutely. As part of Lehigh's uh, submitted reclamation plan to restore the PG&E road, they submitted an intent to install a new road. It would be um, not expansion of an existing road. It was a road that would go into, you'd say, native areas. Um, we did identify a couple issues with that road. Our county geologists indicated it's an area that's subject to landslides, very steep. Uh, it would indicate uh, a new disturbance of area that was native, which is less than preferred than using existing road. Um, that new road we did uh, discern also, I think the intent was to avoid city of Cupertino jurisdiction, uh, but on, under map scrutiny, we determined it actually still does cross a bit into the city's jurisdiction. Um, to summarize, uh, Lehigh submitted uh, the reclamation plan amendment to use that road. Uh, we responded with an incomplete letter that was submitted to Lehigh on and about the same time as the notice of violation. It listed a number of issues, some of the issues I just reported to you. It lists a number of issues having to do with Stevens Creek Quarry and their existing permits don't allow uh, use of a road of that nature. And it asked uh, Lehigh if they intended to use that road, they would have to address these issues and uh, resubmit their plans to the county. And then my understanding is that Lehigh actually withdrew its letter or its application, I should say, for that third route. Ms. Bianca or Mr. Rossi, where are we in this process? Uh, recap just on a point uh, that the the county, um, as some of you may have known at uh, last week's um, Housing, Land Use, Environment and Transportation Committee meeting, um, the county did issue a draft letter um, that was issued to Lehigh. Um, prior to the issuance of that letter by the county, Lehigh had submitted um, its withdrawal of the rock plant Hall Road. Okay, so we had the old PG&E road, that was a problem. Then that resulted in traffic moving to city streets and that was a problem. Then we had a third route that was proposed and just as we were getting ready to say, think that's incomplete, it was withdrawn. Does that mean at this point there is no application pending for that third route? Correct. Okay. Clear as mud, everybody? Okay. In all seriousness, do people follow that chain of events? Heads nodding or shaking? Good. All right. Thank you. One person says expedite the permits to build the road between the two quarries. Then somebody else says, please let the pavement road between Lehigh and Quarry be open for their use. Apparently someone who shares much the same view. All right. Um, some of the issues, this is planning, stem from interaction between Lehigh and Stevens Creek Quarry. Stevens Creek Quarry has been operating without a use permit for two years. Can you tell us what the Board of Supervisors is planning? Good luck with that. Uh, with regard to this use permit and when you plan to take action. So st the short version on that one is Stevens Creek Quarry lack of a op uh, operating without a use permit for the past couple of years. Sure, Stevens Creek Quarry uh, has a use permit, I'm gonna not get the dates correct, that uh, was set to expire about uh, two to three years ago. 
Uh, they did come out, uh, come in and apply uh, to extend that use permit. Uh, it was processed at one point. It was uh, scheduled for the Planning Commission. Uh, it was continued. The Planning Commission didn't take an action. Uh, we do know some of the issues that came up uh, during processing that renewal. Uh, several violations uh, had occurred at Stevens Creek Quarry with respect to the reclamation plan. Uh, we did issue a notice of violation. This had to do with landslides, over steepening of slopes. Uh, some were use of an on-stream pond in coordination with the the regional board and we had issued violations. There's some interlocking requirements between the reclamation plan and the use permit. And so county staff was not comfortable allowing the use permit to be approved uh, given these violations on reclamation. Uh, given that, uh, again, the use permit was not approved, it expired. Uh, following that, uh, Stevens Creek came in, entered into what's called a compliance agreement. Uh, Mr. Rossi uh, talked a little bit about that. A compliance agreement it takes a schedule in which an applicant has to come in and rectify uh, their permits. So in doing so, Stevens Creek uh, acknowledged its operating violation. Uh, it set out a schedule in which to apply for and obtain a use permit and an amended rec plan to address the violations and obtain the use permit. And currently, uh, they're processing through that schedule. I'm going to try and condense that a little, if I may. They used to have a use permit. Yes? Uh, that is correct. And it was going to expire, yes? Correct. And in order to get a new one, they had to apply, yes? Correct. And once they applied, you said, well, we can't give you a new one because you're not in compliance with the conditions of approval on your existing use permit? Uh, reclamation plan. Reclamation plan, thank you. And so now they're in the process of complying through a compliance agreement, which was negotiated between the county and the quarry, yes? That is correct. Okay, and the question specifically asked um, what the, about the Board of Supervisors' role. The Board of Supervisors' role is what? At this point, there isn't one. Uh, the approving body for a use permit is the Planning Commission uh, on appeal. Uh, it would be appealed to the Board of Supervisors if that was the case, and the Board's role would be to consider that appeal. And what's the it that would go to the Planning Commission or the Board of Supervisors? Uh, this would be a use permit and a reclamation plan. But right now, there's a compliance agreement, yes? Correct. And the length of time on that compliance agreement is how long? It, uh, it dictates a schedule that the, that the quarry must follow. And we, we put it in uh, different sections. I'm going to go a bit far and probably ask uh, um, our attorney, Mr. Rossi, to go further if we need to. Uh, we knew part of the challenge with the reclamation plan was discovering uh, if you get into quarry, there's a lot of geologic issues, and due to the landslides, the ability to reclaim those slopes uh, might be feasible or not. Uh, what I mean to say is the first phase of their compliance agreement requires them to do geologic analysis to see what is feasible to restore those slopes. And so we're still within that phase. Uh, they're submitting geologic reports. Uh, once we get through that, the compliance agreement requires them to submit for a use permit and a reclamation plan that um, reclaims the quarry uh, in, with the intelligence that comes out of those geologic reports. So right now, Stevens Creek is in the process of complying with the conditions in the compliance agreement, and that's what they have to do before they can apply for the use permit. That is correct. And if and when they apply for the use permit, that's a decision that will be made at the planning commission level initially? That is correct. And if someone wanted to appeal that, then it would go to the Board of Supervisors where I serve with my four colleagues on appeal, yes? Correct. Okay, sorry about all that, but I wanted to make sure that that complicated process was clear. Here's a straight question. Why has the county not issued a completion notice to Lehigh so Lehigh can commence restoring the creek per the consent decree between Lehigh and the Sierra Club? Uh, well, I'll start. If uh, the <clears throat> representative from Fish and Wildlife also wants to jump in, uh, more than fine. I. Do know we recently issued an incomplete letter uh, to Lehigh. Again, the county is uh, more of a clearinghouse agency. We're not creek restoration specialists or biologist specialists. We're issuing the use permit. But a lot of the review of the restoration plan is relying upon uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps of Engineers, California Fish and Wildlife, uh, Regional Board. We know during reviewing the restoration plan, there's been a lot of questions uh, by those folks. And we know the most recent uh, submittal by Lehigh had a couple of questions, I believe, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife 
uh, to which uh, were unanswered. So we are still waiting for Lehigh to answer those questions with a resubmitted plan. Once they do, uh, we do intend to go forward. Uh, Lehigh has applied for an uh, environmental uh, impact report uh, that evaluates potential environmental impacts uh, associated with that restoration. We have hired an environmental consultant that will prepare that. And we actually have hired an outside contract planner to help facilitate that process. Uh, but to reiterate at the moment, uh, there was some incomplete information in the plans. And uh, responding to our other agencies, we, uh, we, we passed those questions on to Lehigh to respond to. All right, thank you. Here's a question, uh, starts with a statement, says, loved the prohibition of trucks on Stevens Creek slash Foothill. Then the question is one, can it be extended for 20 years? <laughs> Two, if not, how about banning trucks from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and Saturday and Sunday? The trucks are the problem and we don't understand why government can't seriously limit them. Planning? Well, with respect to the, the activity regarding the, the business negotiation between Lehigh and Stevens Creek, again, the county issued a violation, and to our knowledge, that truck traffic has stopped. I'm assuming part of this question is just general truck traffic? No, I think it's specifically about that truck traffic, but I'm going to ask the question a little bit differently, which is the truck traffic has stopped from, for now, but what happens next? And as I mentioned earlier, we have an 11-page single-space letter from the city saying, here's why we think this is illegal activity and, and other activities as well. We have two letters of about five or six pages each from law firms representing Stevens Creek and Lehigh saying, here's why we think um, that's an incorrect assertion. So I know planning is uh, working with the county council's office, our legal counsel, to sort through, all right, what are people prohibited from doing? What are they allowed to do? Uh, and uh, who's got the right arguments on a number of these issues. But the bottom line question, I think, that the questioner was getting to is, all right, so the truck traffic is stopped for now. What happens next with respect to truck traffic? Yeah. So the, the, the action that stopped the truck traffic was a, a violation the county issued to Stevens Creek, which said, in effect, uh, by importing that greenstone, processing it, reselling, it was in violation of their conditions of approval. Uh, in order to remedy that, Stevens Creek would have to apply for, obtain a modifi modification of those conditions that would allow them to do so. And by virtue of that, um, they could apply to allow importation of material and the truck traffic. Uh, through that process, it'd be subject to a review uh, with county codes. Uh, through that process, I'm thinking it's, it's likely to subject to some sort of environmental review analysis. It would be subject to a public hearing. Uh, which would likely be before the Plan Commissioner Board of Supervisors, a notice hearing. Uh, but again, it would be in Stevens Creek Court to apply to the county uh, for permission uh, for the activity, and it would be evaluated by the county in a, in a public process. Another option is that Stevens Creek could contest the notice of violation and go to court. Yes, County Council, planning, somebody? That's correct. They could dispute the existence of the violation that they can do through a county administrative process or through a court process. All right. So to be clear, county planning has issued a notice of violation. That notice of violation was issued in consultation with our legal counsel. That notice of violation has stopped the truck traffic. That notice of violation could be appealed through an administrative process by Stevens Creek or Stevens Creek could litigate and argue that the notice of violation was improperly issued, or they could request a permit which would allow them to um, move the, import the, the product, and then we go through the hearing process that planning just described. Are those the possible possibilities? Yes. All right. But for the moment, barring any of those three things, the truck traffic stays stopped. Yes? Unless they would choose to, to violate the county's notice of violation. And if they chose to violate the county's notice of violation, the consequences for that again are? Administrative penalties. Which amount to? Uh, $1,000 per day per violation. And the violation, each violation is a particular trip by a particular individual truck, yes? Insofar as we could prove that there were a certain amount of trucks that uh, violated the order, each of those trucks would be subject to a separate penalty. Okay, different topic, but still on uh, planning. 
If Lehigh is sold or closed for environmental reasons, can the land be environmentally approved for residential development? Have any permits been applied for or issued to develop this land and the surrounding area for housing? Will the public be advised by the city of Cupertino if so? Okay, so two questions in one. Um, right now the reclamation plan for the, if they stopped operation and the purpose of Samara is to ensure that the quarry is restored uh, following restoration. And the county does retain a very large financial security uh, something I want to make clear, if, if Lehigh was to somehow go out of business, uh, walk away from the site, the intent of that security is to reclaim the site and restore it. Uh, the intended uh, use of the site following restoration is open space. It's not residential use. If some property owner, be it in the future or Lehigh itself, said following restoration, uh, they'd like to propose a residential subdivision, they, they have that right. Uh, my recollection is the zoning for this property's hillsides, our density of development allowed is, is one house per 20 to 160 acres. So it would be a very low density development if that was proposed. Uh, if it did happen, it'd go through a subdivision process, which is a public hearing process. And of course, the, the nature of it um, would be evaluated then. To I think the second part of the question is, has anyone applied for permits, uh, not with us, for any residential development of the property? And forgive me, I was sorting when I should have been listening. I did hear you talk about what an application would look like going to the county and what that would be. Did you mention the potential for annexation? Uh, it is in the, the county's jurisdiction. It's outside the, the city's urban service area. That would be in the city's court if they were to propose an urban service area amendment. Uh, they'd have to obtain approval from LAFCO. Uh, that's the body that approves urban service amendments. Um, I can only speak broadly to that process. That's not the county's process, but Cupertino would have to uh, initiate and go through that process. All right. <coughs> Cupertino want to talk about how interested they'd be in doing that or not? or pass. Yeah. <clears throat> I know there was, a, there was a study session workshop on that topic several months ago on annexation and what the process would be. So, I mean, if, if someone was interested in that, they could go back in our ar archive and look at that. Okay. Uh, question. Could the county board, I think that means the county board of supervisors, vote a new and different vested rights law or rule? Ms. Bianca, is that you? No that was a final determination by our Board of Supervisors. All right, the next question from the same questioner is, if politicians wanted, which body could ban the trucks on Stevens Creek Foothill? That's sort of been addressed. Mr. Eastwood, you, I see you leaning I'll, in. I'll, I'll start, I don't think there's a, a clear answer. Um, I mean, if, if the truck traffic, again, was in violation of their conditions of approval or use permit, uh, that, that, that would serve for us to issue a violation stopping them. As, as folks know and heard tonight, uh, Lehigh is a vested quarry. Part of that vested operation has been the, the selling of Greenstone uh, off of the site. Uh, part of it has, of course, um, they operate under a use permit for the cement plant, and they have cement trucks. Those are separate. Uh, but again, from the county's perspective, uh, we would have to see um, some sort of violation, and, and I think a declaration of public nuisance with that, and, and after that we could uh, see if there's an enforcement action. Okay, I'm moving to a set that I'll call miscellaneous here, and this one uh, is addressed to me, uh, or county council, so I may look down that way. Uh, it's actually been, I think, addressed. Is there any prospect for the Board of Supervisors revisiting its 2011 vested rights decision? And again, Ms. Bianca, you said that was a final determination. That is correct. All right. Why has Lehigh Cement not shifted to clean energy like other companies in California? And I'm going to say probably a question for Lehigh Cement. Okay. The questioner notes a recent report commissioned by Sierra Club reveals the fuels used are at Lehigh are include coal and petroleum coke. And again, I have no knowledge here. Uh, about what the fuels are, I apologize. Question, can you find a way to prevent the use of petroleum coke as fuel? Somebody here? Who knows what the fuels are? Go ahead, tell everybody what's the fuel. 
Petroleum coke. Okay. Are there other fuels as well? They could use coke. Or, sorry, <laughs> coal. Okay, they could use coal. They could use coal. But as far as you know, they use petroleum coke. Yes. Okay. Then the question is, can you find a way to prevent the use of petroleum coke as a fuel? Do you have the authority to either prohibit that particular fuel or require some other fuel which some would deem environmentally preferable? Trying to help the no, questioner don't. get an answer. Okay. We do not. Does somebody else have that authority? All right. It is hard for me to understand that with all the counsel Lehi has. No one grasped that they may have been doing something inappropriate to allow the internal road use to proceed between operations. Compliance is so important. Why was this overlooked by the Lehigh Legal Counsel? Thank you. And again, I think that's probably a question for Lehigh that our panel cannot answer tonight. Folks, I'm going to ask you to just hold your comments, please. Thanks. And how does one, now I'm bouncing back because we have a, a range of questions and we're almost out of time. How does one confirm or verify that we will be notified for Title V public input? I think that one's for Backman. Uh, we maintain an interested parties list. You can go on our website if you're interested in a particular facility or you're interested in a particular area to be notified of any kind of permitting actions. Uh, we'll also post on our website. Uh, so you can look to our website in the next uh, two to three weeks where we'll post uh, the draft uh, renewal Title V permit. Okay. Noise still coming over from Lehigh, coming over the hill from Lehigh to our area, Monta Vista. The noise is definitely reduced, but not completely eliminated. Using equipment to measure the noise level is one thing. What neighbors experiencing is another. Uh, we do not really care about what the noise meter reads. We just do not want any noise from Lehigh. Why don't we see if there's a reaction uh, to that, maybe a brief description of what the noise ordinance is, how it compares or contrasts to other noise ordinances in the area. I get the message loud and clear that somebody's saying, hey, Whatever the ordinance says, the noise is still annoying to us. But so the Department of Environmental Health, like I mentioned earlier, enforces the noise sections of the ordinance code. So when we go out and respond to complaints, we are looking for any exceedances of those noise, noise limits. So it's not an elimination of all all noise. It's all based on any exceedances of the noise limits. Um, previously, we were looking into other noise ordinances and we found that the noise ordinance code of the county is a lot more stringent than those of some cities that we looked into. And at this point, I do not have a recollection of the cities that we looked into, but there are quite a few that we checked and the county ordinances were, were more stringent. All right. And what is the approximate value of the Lehigh plant which government agency can perform an assessment? County Council, planning? I, I don't know the, the value of the plan. Uh, the only thing I can imagine is the county assessor might be a resource uh, in assessing the, the value of the plan. Okay. And I am looking at the clock, folks, and we are just about at that nine o'clock time. So what I want to do is say thank you again to all of the panelists for being here. I should acknowledge we had scores of questions we could not get to tonight. As I indicated earlier, I'll ask my staff to divvy up the questions, get them to the various relevant agencies, see if we can get written responses, and put them up on the web page. Um, we have a number of folks who are here from the county who are in the audience. If you are here for, as county staff in some form or fashion, would you raise your hands? I wanted to introduce, thank you, all the way in the back and here, but I also want to introduce our new planning director who um, has been with us now for just a couple of months, uh, was kind enough to spend her evening with us tonight, uh, as well as attend the previous meeting. 
Um, as I told her, welcome to Santa Clara County. Uh, and um, this is one of the first issues that has greeted her. Again, I want to say that your questions um, will be submitted, uh, so sorted, and we hope to get you answers as well. I want to thank you all for coming out. We were stymied tonight by the fact that uh, some folks turned in 10, 20, 30 questions, and so it was a little hard to, uh, get, to get to individual questions, uh, but we did the best we could with time. A um, Couple of quick points, and uh, let me ask Mr. Eastwood. Um, Information on the county website at the planning department includes what at this point? For folks um, who are interested? Sure. We, we do, we, in my opinion, we have a pretty robust uh, page on Lehigh. It has the reclamation plan, uh, has a lot of reports to go to the planning commission. I did realize we don't have the recent correspondence and we are intending to FAQ regarding the trucks. And I'll just go ahead and, and state that we intend to get that up in the next week. Uh, we do have actually a, a page on Stevens Creek, if folks are interested, uh, the existing permits and requirements. And we do have links to all the agencies. Uh, we know folks struggle, again, to get information on different agencies, what happen what's happening. We do encourage those agencies, knowing a lot of folks come to our website first. If they have notices or information, they're free to use our website to post them. But um, again, you can use our website as a clearinghouse that both has a lot of county information and it has links uh, to a lot of the agencies that you see up here. All right. And there's a sort of a simplified version on my webpage for uh, supervisorsubmidian.com. You can find a number of the documents there, just things like the letters that have gone back and forth between uh, the city and the legal counsel for the two uh, quarries, uh, the notice of violation documents, uh, letters I've sent in years gone by. I see uh, Mr. Lee wanting to get a word in uh, edgewise here before we wrap things up. Please yeah, I would, yeah, I would like that. So that the city is also maintaining a web page um, for Lehigh, specifically also on the increased truck traffic. So that that's really a good resource. Many of you have have elected to be an interested party on that and get automatic email notifications. Um, you know, I'll be available after this if you want if you need to have that website address. But if you just go to our website, type in Lehigh, you're you're going to get there. Um, and also um, on the particulate issue, we also there's a an error quality monitor that's located on Foothill just north of Stevens Creek Boulevard. And you'll find a, a link to that real-time real monitor and you can, you can track and plot uh, Particulate Matter 2.5 uh, from that site. All right, that wraps it up with the following uh, one or two quick items, please. The first is, um, I didn't get asked tonight, but I have been asked in recent weeks, do I have a position on this set of issues? And my position is actually relatively simple. I did articulate it at the Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee meeting, and it's this. We expect all of our operators to follow the law. We expect all of our county departments and agencies to do their jobs. That includes my office as a county supervisor. Uh, as you've heard tonight, the day-to-day -day regulatory authority for handling these issues rests with professional staff in various government bodies and agencies, individual county supervisors are not making those determinations. That being said, I do think individual supervisors can and should play a role in pulling people together at the county, for example, to say, hey, we've got an issue, can we make sure we're all on it? Uh, and by convening folks as we did tonight to make sure that people get their questions answered, and if not answered tonight, as I said, answered subsequently. So I thank you all for coming as I did at the beginning. Uh, our hope and expectation, our plan is to do this again next year, uh, and uh, we hope that by doing it, uh, we have fewer rather than greater numbers of issues to resolve. Uh, but could I ask you to join me before you walk out the door in thanking our panelists who ordinarily don't make a point of being out and about in the evening. Uh, this is a sort of a special exercise. Appreciate the fact that these agencies did take the time and make the commitment to show up and be accessible. So I say thank you to all of them for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Drive home safely. We'll see you soon.